Thank you, Rick and John. A little bit nervous giving a talk without videos. It's been a while, but I hope I'll figure it out. Also, have to fit in about three hours of talks into the next 14 minutes, but I'll do my best. So when we think of medical therapy, I guess this is truly minimally invasive therapy, or no invasion at all. Um, we have to break down the disease, uh, I think at least, into whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and at least in some way classify the patient when we initially see them uh, as to how we're going to uh, start and commence their therapy, and also assess them, which I think is important for us as surgeons, for whether they've been adequately treated before we operate on them. Mild disease uh, can most generally be treated with uh, amino salicylates, uh, often topically, particularly for distal disease, uh, often orally. And I think something uh, many, even gastroenterologists, forget to do sometimes is use combination of oral uh, and topical therapy, uh, and that can be quite useful. Moderate disease, obviously thinking of the 5-ASA products, but also adding in uh, steroids, which again can be given topically. Uh, and then most severe disease, and uh, we'll be talk about some of the other therapies for that in a moment. When we think of the 5-ASA delivery platforms, really, uh, because the way these products are released throughout the intestine really gives them uh, different approaches and different profiles. Uh, well, uh, mesalabine is released, uh, as you know, in stomach and throughout the entire intestine, uh, and then some of the other products are release, released a little lower in the colon. Uh, so thinking of people with uh, pan-small bowel disease or terminal ileal disease, uh, we'll be thinking of uh, Pantaza as a product with earlier release uh, rather than uh, Azacal, different products. So not often that you would generalize or distinguish between different products, uh, but here is somewhere I think it is important. Now, when we think about uh, response, which is our goal when we're giving this oral therapy, um, we have to balance that against toxicity. But there are increasing data showing that dose really does matter for the 5-ASA products. And if you're giving three or four grams a day, the response rate's much higher than, uh, you know, 250 milligrams four times a day is really an inadequate dose. So it's very important to make sure that patients have been receiving an adequate dose before we deem them failures uh, with 5-ASA products. Uh, here, they're just looking at response rates uh, with uh, Pentaza or Azacol on the right. Uh, again, often which you'll use depends on the distribution of the disease, uh, but you can see the improvement in response rates with the highest dose, four grams of Pentaza versus placebo or four grams of Azacol versus placebo, getting better response rates than the lower doses. And this is a consistent finding in many studies now. What about combination of oral and topical therapy? Again, just looking at 5-ASA products, uh, we can see if you wait, and obviously waiting a certain amount of time obviously gives the medical therapy time to properly kick in, uh, but by six weeks you can see that there's a, a clear improvement giving combined therapy versus just oral uh, or just topical therapy alone. So combination therapy is important, and I, I think that's one of the important messages uh, when we think of medical therapy for IBD. Then looking at the enemas, uh, what you actually uh, give, um, 5, ASI, 5 ASA products against corticosteroid enemas uh, with time, again, just showing that dose uh, and combination therapy matter. Now, when do we build in immuno immunomodulation into the medical therapy for inflammatory bowel disease? Well, it really depends on the severity of the disease. Cyclosporin has certainly been written about many times, uh, but I think many institutions uh, seeing high volumes of IBD are still a little hesitant to use cyclosporin in practice for patients who come in with toxic colitis. And generally now, patients have been on biologics already, and by the time they get in and they're either having a severe acute colitic episode that's not responding to medical therapy, uh, or they're presenting acutely with disease, uh, there are very few patients who are really good candidates for cyclosporin, perhaps those who have a very early diagnosis uh, and are really psychologically troubled by a very recent diagnosis racing to a very emergent operation with uh, probably an end stoma because they're so acutely unwell. And generally, they're the kind of patients that we reserve cyclosporin for a fairly small percentage of the population. Uh, and then uh, patients who are corticosteroid dependent uh, or indeed refractory, uh, they're the patients who we're going to think of for uh, giving a, a azathioprine or 6-MP2. Uh, and if you get a response with that, these can be very good agents uh, for maintaining a response to medications. 
So when the disease is more refractory or, or more troublesome, uh, again, for distal disease, uh, think of uh, the topical products and think of combination, like we've said, but also build in uh, immunomodulation. For more extensive disease, obviously, you have to combine oral therapy as opposed to just topical therapy. Again, thinking of steroids in the shorter term uh, and immunomodulation in the longer term. Uh, as yet unanswered questions, smoking certainly can be protective for ulcerative colitis, difficult to recommend it, and so studies being done with nicotine, etc. Antibiotics, probably little role, uh, although it brings up an important point, remem remembering that the patient with refractory colitis uh, who gets an acute flare uh, may, may be C. diff superimposed on colitis, and it's important to exclude those patients who could very easily be treated with antibiotics and get back to their baseline colitis, which may be easily controlled without surgery. Uh, and infliximab being increasingly used, and uh, data a little less clear for ulcerative colitis. Uh, again, generally not used by surgeons and generally a decision made before we ever get to see the patient. What about Crohn's then? Uh, inducing remission, again a step-based approach, um, 5 ASA products, uh, antibiotics, a little concern about side effects uh, and indeed I think some concern about true efficacy with them. Um, budesonide, uh, more recently being used here in the US, it's been used for a long time in Europe uh, and certainly it's an effective agent. Uh, here, and uh, I'm not quite sure what happened to the bars in this graph, a uh, little uh, uh, transition of uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, error there, uh, but the percentages are correct. Uh, and you can see uh, mesalamine in the left graphic here, 60% uh, response rate versus placebo. It is effective uh, alone and again with increasing dose, uh, you can see uh, low dose is essentially not much different to placebo, four grams a day, just like in the ulcerative colitis patients, four grams a day giving a good response. As the disease becomes more severe, uh, bringing in prednisone, budesonide, and of course infliximab, for which there is much more data than in ulcerative colitis. Here, looking at budesonide, um, and you can see, again, a significant response and nine milligrams has become the, the standard dose used, being it's the lowest uh, clinically effective dose. While this has uh, less Cushingoid side effects associated with it, something important to remember with budesonide is that it does have the same effect on loss of bone density. So long-term therapy with budesonide is not complication-free. Again, once induced, remission can be maintained with combination therapy with immunomodulation. Uh, and here, uh, looking at the odds ratio on the lowest part of this, uh, just seeing uh, how effective uh, combination therapy uh, can be. Uh, it's you know, reproducibly shown in many studies. Antibiotics, uh, less clear, uh, and as I mentioned, concern about complications. Those with most severe disease, well, be it Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, as John talked about a few minutes ago, are the patients who end up in hospital uh, getting, getting boluses of intravenous corticosteroids, uh, infliximab if they haven't been tried, uh, certainly reasonable to consider uh, before surgery. Uh, antibiotics, I think particularly important to remember in those with C. diff or who may have C. diff. Uh, and again, this decision about whether or not to use cyclosporine, I think it's for a small population of patients. What about infliximab then? Because certainly it changed uh, medical practices. Um, before referring patients for surgery? Well, uh, as with many biologics, it's not a, a dose response curve that improves with increasing dose. Um, uh, and here you can see five milligrams per kilogram was the most effective dose uh, in the earliest studies. Uh, but it certainly uh, effectively induces remission in many patients, at least uh, in the short term. Similarly, uh, in patients with fistulizing disease, uh, Dan Present study, uh, more than 10 years ago now, um, but most effective at a lowest dose, classical with these uh, biologic agents. Uh, interestingly, um, we have to remember infliximab is not minor therapy though. And in a way, the complication rates with infliximab can be as high as, or in some cases higher than surgery. Uh, and some of the complications are very significant. Uh, lymphoma, <coughs> TB, for which there's a black box warning, congestive heart failure, and death, all significant issues. <coughs> Excuse me. Maintaining remission, uh, again, combination therapy and stage-based therapy. Five ASA products um, may maintain it. Immunomodulators are very useful. 
methotrexate is used by certain gastroenterologists, but the compli thanks very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, complication profile with methotrexate can be significant, uh, so we, I must say, generally don't use it. Another important point with medical therapy, and important when we're assessing patients when they come to surgery, is they may have been on this therapy, but have they been adherent to it? And somebody who has not been adequately adhering to their therapy may not necessarily be a candidate for surgery. They may ne need just better monitoring of their therapy, an important consideration. Fistulizing disease uh, with Remicade, and these are photos from the initial paper, uh, I think we have to remember uh, that the endpoints in many of these tr in trials were a reduction in numbers of draining fistulas, not completely curing the patients of their fistulas. Uh, and secondly, the median duration of closure of these fistulas was often short and measured in months. So it's certainly not a panacea for fistulas or for Crohn's disease. Uh, and indeed, you can see the complete closure uh, at a year with infliximab uh, was um, slightly better than placebo, but still only about 30%. What about indications for surgery then? Well, when these patients get to surgery, and John has addressed many of these issues already, they're a, a very unhealthy population of patients, often obese from their steroids, often nutritional issues which need to be assessed before surgery, who are presenting for complicated procedures, uh, and that often, and particularly with ulcerative colitis, need extensive discussion about the options available and stages available. The indications for surgery, well, really failure of medical therapy, uh, and that may present in many different ways. Uh, obstruction, less common. Abscess or fistula, discussed in that initial case report, and again, often managed initially conservatively or with interventional drainage uh, and a staged procedure. Uh, and that way we can often prevent the patient having a temporary ostomy. More acute presentations, uh, perforation and hemorrhage, obviously those need to be addressed surgically. Uh, and toxic colitis, which John talked about in more detail, again, a good option uh, to treat laparoscopically. Neoplasia, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment. Uh, Crohn's disease, really actually the indications in a way are very similar to those for ulcerative colitis in that it's failure of medical therapy. I think the very important distinction, however, is remembering that we're really not curing these patients of their Crohn's disease and we're simply trying to improve their symptoms uh, for a period of time. Uh, and that's why uh, you don't necessarily rush in to operate uh, if you can temporize. We're not curing their disease, we're operating for their quality of life. Cumulative risk of surgery for Crohn's disease is high. When patients are operated on with the right indications, they can get very good results. Uh, some of uh, our data that we looked at some time ago, uh, in patients with having pouch surgery, they get good function, six bowel movements a day, one at night, excellent continence and good quality of life scores. Uh, and, and we've published data on this several times. One of the important things to think about, and medical therapy for IBD does continue after surgery. Uh, about a third of patients, depending on your definition for pouchitis, will get pouchitis. Pouchitis is not necessarily just pouchitis. Uh, it can be disease in the cuff, uh, and a certain population of patients really won't have much, but they'll be symptomatic, and it's probably a component of irritable bowel or irritable pouch uh, syndrome. Pouchoscopy helps distinguish, and uh, looking for ulcers in the afferent limb to the pouch uh, is an important way of distinguishing. John spoke about indeterminate colitis. Uh, certainly that is, a, is an indication for an ileoanal anastomosis. The majority of patients do very well, and while they have a slightly higher rate of, of developing Crohn's disease, uh, or having it already, uh, most people keep their, pa keep their pouches well uh, and are very asymptomatic. Redo pouch surgery, uh, I'm actually not going to address, but the majority of patients, again, thinking of complications after pouch surgery and medical therapy, can actually be treated well medically, even if they f are found to have Crohn's at a later stage. And those who do end up having a redo pouch gives you a second surgical option, and many of those do well. Very briefly, cancer risk. Obviously, in both Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, uh, patients are at risk of uh, increased risk of uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, the risk rises with time and rises with the amount of colon involved. Uh, here we can see disease extent, duration, PSC are the primary factors involved, and then also things like age, presence of stricture, family history, etc. <clears throat> so time, 
uh, and extent of the disease being the primary variables. Surveillance is important. Uh, after eight or 10 years, uh, they should be having an annual uh, endoscopy. Biopsies need to be taken every 10 centimeters for biopsies. Uh, so circumferentially, up, right, left, and down every 10 centimeters as one withdraws being sent uh, for dysplasia, and we're assessing for dysplasia here. If you see a dysplasia-associated mass, if it's an adenoma-like uh, feature, uh, you can treat it like an adenoma uh, if there's no uh, dysplasia in the surrounding colon. Uh, if it's non-adenoma-like, that's probably an indication for resection. And there are published, and I'm not going to go through this, uh, but there are published um, algorithms uh, for deciding who should and who should not have a resection. If patients have dysplasia, thinking about removing the anal transitional zone, and that may mean, a, mean an S pouch for reconstruction rather than a J pouch. Thank you very much. So in conclusion, a complex condition, but it's important to factor in the medical therapy and decide that the patient has had adequate therapy uh, before we go to surgery and to collaborate with the gastroenterologist.